Well, good morning and welcome to Daily Prayer. Today is Monday the 14th of June. I hope you're well. I hope you've had a good weekend. As always, we use the form of prayer written by the Reverend David Adam in his book, The Rhythm of Life. We'll use one of today's Bible readings and a reflection on that reading. On a Monday, the sort of umbrella theme of prayer is uh, creation. And so as we gather near the beginning of the week, near the beginning of the day, we remember that we're in the presence of God and we pray to God, the Father who created the world, to God, the Son who redeemed the world, to God, the Holy Spirit who sustains the world, for your praise and glory now and forever. Amen. Awaken us to your glory, dispel the darkness of night, destroy our heaviness of heart, cure the blindness of our sight, heal the deafness of our ears, open the mouth that is dumb, restore a gentleness of touch, encourage in us a sense of adventure, bring us an awareness of you, awaken us to your glory. And the psalm on a Monday is Psalm 8. How exalted is your name in all the world. O Lord our Governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. Out of the mouths of infants and children, your majesty is praised above the heavens. You have set up a stronghold against your adversaries to quell the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in their courses, what are mortals that you should be mindful of them? mere human beings that you should seek them out. You have made them little lower than the angels. You adorn them the glory and honour. You give them mastery over the works of your hands and put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, even the wild beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever walks in the paths of the sea. O Lord our Governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. And we continue reading from St Paul's letter to the Romans and we've reached chapter 9, Romans chapter 9. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship, there's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I may display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Another challenging passage from St Paul. And um, so we'll see what the reflection says. Uh, this week, the reflections are written by the Reverend Margaret Whip, and she says this. Paul's mood shifts dramatically at this point in the letter. His heart turns to anguish over the unbelief of his own people, his Jewish kindred, according to the flesh. Oh, my people, for centuries, prophetic souls have poured out their lamentations to God. How can it be that God's chosen people should be so blind to his grace? Blessed in so many ways, how could they ignore the great covenant promise that is now being fulfilled in Christ? 
glorying in the gospel that is extending to include all people, even the Gentiles, it must be agonising for Paul to think that his own kindred might be left out through unbelief. Paul turns instinctively to heartfelt prayer and grappling with the scriptures. There must be a larger pattern. God will hold out a greater hope. This is the deep existential struggle of the prayer of lament. In the face of human bewilderment, we pour out our dashed hopes and unanswered questions to an ever gracious Lord. Great souls are unashamed to bring their lamentations to the Lord, not hiding from their grievous disappointments, not grasping for simplistic answers, but wrestling wholeheartedly to embrace the ways of a costlier holiness and truth. When did you last pray like that? And there's a challenge, that heartfelt grappling prayer, unashamed lamentation, wrestling to embrace the ways of holiness. And so we do turn to prayer now. For the beauty of the earth, for the mystery of creation, for the wonders of the universe, for the power within all things, for all who work the land, for all who care for our planet, for all involved in conservation, all who improve our environment, Father of all, we praise you. Upon all who are suffering from hunger, upon the world's refugees, upon all prisoners of tyranny and war, upon all who are exploited, upon the underprivileged, Lord, come in hope. Father of all creation, we thank you that you have given us a world rich in resources and made us stewards of your mysteries. Help us to act responsibly, not wasting or destroying what we do not need, not polluting the earth or sea or sky, that we may act with love towards all things and so reflect the great love you have for the world. And a prayer written by the Corrymeela community in Northern Ireland. God in deepening relationships, God in continuing conversation, may we welcome each other with courage, knowing that being together changes who we are. We pray that through respectful relationships we transform the imbalances of power to allow each one of us to fully belong. And may it be that in holding silence and in listening well to each other, we hear your voice in the midst of us. Amen. And we pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The sun and the stars, the valleys and the hills, the rivers and the lakes, all disclose your presence. The roaring breakers of the sea tell of your awesome might. The beasts of the field and the birds of the air proclaim your wondrous will. In your goodness you've made us able to hear the music of the world. The voices of loved ones reveal to us that you are in our midst. A divine song sings through all creation. Lord our God, you renew the face of the earth and bring newness to our world. Restore the waters, refresh the air, revive the land, breathe new life into all your creation and begin with us. The Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, bless and guide you in all that you do, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life, which is eternal. Amen. So thank you so much for joining me for prayer this morning. I hope you have a great day. Do comment, and let me know you're here. And if you're able to join me again tomorrow, I'll be back here at 9.45. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.